second or probably third visit uh, to Washington DC was in February 2010 and I was part of a group of activists uh, with the project of nuclear awareness organization and we had gone to America's capital uh, in support of our cause to abolish nuclear weapons worldwide and so we went to DC with two primary goals one was to engage with a panel of experts on the so-called threat of a nuclear Iran. And the second agenda was to lobby the US Congress to support our cause in an effort to abolish nuclear weapons worldwide. At this point in time, tensions between Iran and Israel had reached unparalleled heights. In fact, we went to Washington DC expecting that there would be a war within a year and that inevitably the US would be dragged into it and then all of a sudden we'll be facing a major war in the Middle East. Then all bets would be off. The human toll would be unimaginable. Now the bone of contention here is that Israel believed that Iran was pursuing a nuclear bomb. Iran, on the other hand, made the case that they were purely pursuing nuclear energy. Now, as the drumbeats of war got louder and increased, neither the US nor Israel actually sent troops or dropped bombs in Iran to stop the Iranian nuclear activity. Instead, a malicious computer code that became known as Stuxnet attacked Iran's main nuclear enrichment facilities and achieved what was sought, which was a rollback of the Iranian nuclear program. Now, two years after that Washington DC visit, I was part of a group of experts that were selected to help come up with policy recommendations for the NATO Heads of Summit, the NATO Heads of State Summit that was taking place that year. Now even as we dealt with conventional peace and conflict issues like the Arab uprisings and Libya, of which I was a lead facilitator, cybersecurity had become an important question that we were grappling with. It had moved from being a non-traditional threat to being a key concern for the Western alliance. This was in part due to the ever-increasing attacks on Western defense, government, and industry systems, but especially after the discovery of Stuxnet. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a brave new world where wars are fought using computer software and the ability of a country to defend itself hinges on the capacity to defend computer systems and manage information technology that is permeating across the private and public sector. Just last year, Kenya arrested a number of individuals for allegedly hacking into the Kenya Revenue Authority, top banks, as well as major retail chains in the country. These hackers got away with millions of dollars. About three years ago, Kenya arrested about 77 Chinese nationals for allegedly infiltrating Kenyan communication systems and operating equipment that was capable of infiltrating the Kenyan government systems, the ATM systems, the M-PESA mobile uh, money uh, app, as well as a variety of communication infrastructure in the country. So Kenya is not immune, neither is Africa immune. But this cybersecurity challenge, while it poses a threat to those of us in the global south developing our technological infrastructure, 
It also presents an uncertainty for even the most advanced and technologically advanced economies. Consider this. About five years ago, the U.S. suffered one of its biggest breaches when hackers stole information relating to more than 20 million Americans from the Office of Personnel Management, essentially the U.S. government's human resource department. Hackers have infiltrated and hacked and stolen information from U.S. government agencies ranging from the Internal Revenue Service to the State Department to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, even the White House. More recently, actually a month ago, the U.S. Department of Justice indicted 13 Russians and three Russian companies for allegedly conducting an information warfare that was geared towards creating discord in America and diminishing public confidence in democracy. This is the so-called fake news phenomenon during the 2016 election in which Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton for the presidency. So then the question begs, what about cases in which there is limited digitization? Because we know the more we digitize, the more risk we are inviting. Yet even in cases of limited digitization, the effects of cyber warfare because of our global interconnectedness and the nature of our globalization means that a ripple, the cyber attack in one end of the world would have ripple effects in the other end of the world. Now let me give you an example. Consider that last year, the world's biggest shipping company, Maersk, suffered a major cyber attack which impacted its global operations for two weeks and the company lost about 300 million US dollars. That's about the total amount of revenue that is allocated to all the coastal counties, including Kalipi, Kuala, Lamu, Mombasa, Malindi, Tanariva, and Taita. Mombasa, as a port city, lay vulnerable to lost revenue and job losses for temporary workers who depend on these day-to-day -day contracts. So what do we do about the cyber security challenge? We have so many problems that have been around for so long and seem more pressing. We're still trying to figure out basic healthcare management, our food, our security, our roads, our urban city planning, our rural development, our energy needs. The ruthlessness of Al Shabaab is so close to home. It is in fact home. And the Sabaoth Land Defense Force up in Mount Elgin continues to terrorize and maim innocent civilians. We have a problem in which a lot of men with weapons have control over large swaths of land. So the list is long for sure. Yet I remind you that even as we deal with challenges that have been dispensed with by other nations long ago, we are still part of this world. So as we steadily move through the 19th or the 20th century in some way, this world of which we are part is huddling through the 21st century. That is why we should listen to Robert Mugabe. Now, Robert Mugabe became the first head of state in the world to elevate cybersecurity to a cabinet level position. So he created, just about a month before he left office or forced out of office, he created this Ministry of Cybersecurity, Threat Detection and Mitigation. Now, at the time, it was easy to laugh off Robert Mugabe. In fact, the jokes were that he had created the Ministry to control Facebook and WhatsApp. 
but lost on these jokes is that their ability to control social media or even just Facebook or WhatsApp means their ability to control and manage information. That is power. In this day and age, that is so much power that it could have potentially impacted, significantly impacted, the election of the leader of the free world. So when Robert Mugabe created this ministry, the two stated objectives were, number one, create Zimbabwe's own cyber defense systems so that they could be able to protect themselves against cyber crime. The second objective of this ministry was to control social media and cyberspace. Now, Mugabe's focus on these issues is telling, and there are two lessons we can draw from it. The first one is that we all have a role to play in this world that is riddled with cyber warfare. And it's in part because of the devices and the services that we use in technology. Secondly, we, Kenya, Africa, developing nations, need to build our own capacity. It is projected that in 2019, there will be about a 1.5 million gap uh, in the global cybersecurity workforce, and the cybersecurity industry has a market cap of around 100 billion US dollars uh, in 2020. So that means that our youth have the chance to develop skills that would mean gainful employment. Our youth have the opportunity to, de to develop businesses uh, that would lead to employment and revenue for the country. Our youth have the ability to develop skill sets that would protect our nation, our economies. Now, one interesting thing about this cybersecurity challenge is that it sort of created an even playing field. And by that I mean not even the world's biggest economy is completely immune from the cybersecurity challenge. So we have a chance to catch up. The cybersecurity challenge can be successfully seized if we were to build a workforce, a worrying workforce that would protect our countries, that would protect our economies. And this worrying workforce should be skilled in the arts and sciences. We need the left brain and we need the right brain. So whether you think creatively or whether you think linearly, wherever you are in your professional or academic career, Ladies and gentlemen, we need you. Thank you.